Uh, we're joined here today by 1994 Tennessee delegate and academic expert, Samantha Hopkins. As we go along, put your questions in the chat and we'll ask them as we go. Without any further ado, Samantha Hopkins, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Brian. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about some of the work that I do as a, a paleontologist working on conservation questions. And I'm gonna try and convince you that um, that paleontology and, and studying things that have been dead for a very long time um, is actually a really important way of thinking about prospects for, um, for conservation and, and how we protect the ecosystems going forward. It's a little, little bit counterintuitive, but um, bear with me and we'll see what I can um, convince you of. So, um, Act on ecosystems, I, I probably don't have to um, convince this audience is, is essentially unprecedented. The, the rate at which we are changing um, the, the Earth's environment is, is pretty crazy. Um, you know, there's a lot of dimensions to this. There are a lot of ways in which we're changing the, the planet around us. Um, obviously, climate change really is, um, is kind of in the forefront of a lot of people's minds, and, and there's a lot of thought about um, you know, the ways in which um, carbon emissions are creating um, uh, climate change and are changing the, the um, temperatures and precipitation regimes and things like that. Um, there's also some other dimensions to this. So um, habitat alteration, for example, right? We, we build on um, substantial parts of the, the Earth's surface. Um, we are um, also altering habitats in um, a lot of the places even where we're not doing a whole lot of building, right? So agriculture and um, and resource um, extraction are uh, altering habitats over a much larger swath of the earth than we've actually done much in the way of, of building on, right? Um, there's some massive issues with soil erosion, right? This is one of the things is that as we change um, land cover, right? As we, you know, remove um, trees and things like that, um, we're not always great about retaining soil. Um, and we also move water around in ways that cause more soil erosion and so forth. Um, so that's a thing. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of thought has gone into you know, air, water, and soil pollution, right? The, the ways that we um, emit uh, chemicals and, and um, you know, byproducts of our industry um, into, um, into the soil and the air and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, from my point of view as a paleontologist, the thing about this that is really the most profoundly unprecedented is that we're doing it all at the same time. And it's all driven by the actions of a single species, right, Homo sapiens. Um, it's really easy for us right now, at least for those of us who are conscious of what is going on around us to, to see all of this change is profound and unprecedented. But um, it turns out if you look at earth history, many of the dimensions of this um, actually are not quite as unprecedented as you might think. Um, and so from the point of view of um, somebody who thinks in earth history, um, there are some events in the history of the earth that um, might offer to us some lessons in, in how these changes happen and, and how they work and what's the you know, underlying mechanism by which um, ecosystems respond to these kinds of changes, right? Um, so, you know, if you spend much time at all looking at the record of um, life on earth as it has been for, I don't know, the last half a billion years or so, um, you know, we have a series of events in, in earth's history um, that, that can offer us some lessons here. Um, all of you probably heard people discuss the question of whether or not humans are driving a mass extinction, right? The, the history of life on earth records something like five really mass extinctions, right? And most recent of these is, um, is at the um, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, the extinction of the dinosaurs or the non-avian dinosaurs that you're probably familiar with. Um, and certainly you've seen the comparisons between ongoing human mediated change and and those mass extinction events, the question of whether we're driving one of those, okay? Um, so certainly, 
you know, those are events where you see, you know, massive species impacts and you can, um, you can make a comparison and say, you know, are we driving extinctions at that level? Short answer, no, not yet. Um, you know, but there are also some other events that, that maybe don't get quite as much press and that are worth um, considering when we're looking at how um, humans are altering ecosystems. So, um, for example, rapid climate change is not um, unprecedented in Earth history. There's actually a number of climate change events. And this is something I'll talk a little bit about, a uh, little bit more about. Um, but, but climate change has changed, uh, has occurred in the past um, on a number of occasions. Um, we generally think of it as this sort of slow, gradual thing in the absence of something like humans emitting um, masses of, uh, of carbon dioxide and, and methane and things like that. Um, but in fact, there are events in the past that seem to have climate change events similar in magnitude to what humans are doing now, um, and in some cases actually similar in rate, um, even to the worst case scenarios now. So that's, um, to some people, that is a bit of a surprise. Um, this is not me minimizing the importance of this. Um, paleontologically, you could sure as heck see those events, and there are some, some lessons to be learned from what um, ecosystems do in response to those rapid climate change events. It's not trivial, um, but it isn't as though that aspect of what we're doing is totally unprecedented. There are some things we can look at to figure out what's happened in the past. Um, habitat change also, so um, changes in the structures of habitats um, at the level at which our, you know, our alteration of Earth habitats um, is happening. This is not unprecedented either, right? So there have been changes in structures of habitats in some cases precipitated by change in climate and in some cases precipitated by um, changes in the biological environment, by the evolution of new forms or um, the sort of increasing dominance of new forms, their immigration into new, um, new ecosystems and so forth, where they, they come and change all the things around them. So there are events there that we can look at again that, that might help with um, uh, understanding how habitat change might affect biodiversity, right? Um, and then there are um, some things that I've sort of classified here as, uh, as geologic catastrophes. Um, that is um, events in, in the earth that have kind of big wide ranging events, um, you know, things like um, the eruption of flood basalts, which are these massive volcanic eruptions that cover, um, you know, hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of square kilometers in, in you know, cooling magma, right? That might be um, something that, that might have some important effects, right? Um, so sometimes these catastrophes um, can have some effects um, that might mimic what humans are doing. Um, and given that we're in the middle of this massive uncontrolled experiment in what, um, you know, ecosystem alteration does to Earth's biodiversity, um, it's not a bad idea to see if we have some past um, experiments um, that we can draw on to get some understanding of what we can expect and what what sort of um, you know uh, what sort of responses we expect to see out of uh, Earth Earth systems and how to mitigate them. So, um, how can we use the record of these past events to understand um, ongoing human mediated ecosystem change? Um, there are several really useful ways that that it can inform our thinking. Um, keeping in mind that what we're doing now probably combines things in a way that has rarely happened in the past, right? It combines all these effects at once in a way that, that we don't see a whole lot in the past. Um, one of the benefits of looking at Earth history to think about these kinds of events is that you can tease apart the individual effects of some of the different things that we're doing, right? So if you look at a climate change event that maybe isn't associated with structural change in habitats, um, you can get a sense of how biodiversity responds to climate change in the absence of, um, of habitat alteration or um, you know, air, water, and soil pollution, that kind of thing, right? Similarly, you can um, find some of these geologic catastrophes that caused pollution but didn't actually cause massive climate change. And you can tease that apart and say, what part of what we're seeing is a response to pollution or to climate change or to habitat alteration or whatever, right? So that we can target the causes of um, biodiversity change in, um, in a more informed way, right? 
Um, another advantage that the Earth history has in this is that um, you know we've we've all heard that um, these ecosystem changes um, are going to have long-term effects that go well beyond um, you know what we what we do right. So if we stopped emitting um, you know carbon dioxide right now, um, we would still see you know climate um, warming for a substantial amount of time for you know hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. Um, and, and so there's long-term effects of these changes um, that we're trying to forecast based on you know, the very small changes that have happened so far to, to ecosystems. Um, looking back in Earth history allows us to look at the whole history of the thing, right? So in the climate change like this, how long did it take before the effects wore off, right? What, how far out do you have to go before you see a system that seems to have returned to a, a native state? How fast do systems respond? Those kinds of questions are ones that you can answer better by using um, data from Earth history. Um, you can also understand some of the effects of other variables. So um, things like um, geography, sort of where you are on the planet, um, the you know, connectedness of you know, one continent to another or one ocean to another. How does that affect how the fauna responds, how the, how the flora responds to um, to ecosystem change, right? Um, because we can look at repeated events through Earth history, we can get a sense of how those variables um, affect things and hence get a better sense of what is a one-off effect and what is um, uh, something we can expect to see every time, right? So that gets us closer to something like a controlled experiment, right? This is not something you can do a controlled experiment with. Earth systems are a bit too big and complex to um, make an a experiment out of them. Um, but if you look at repeated uncontrolled experiments in Earth history, you can get a sense of how those variables interact. Um, and all of this makes it easier for us to start to be able to build predictive models for the impacts of um, ecosystem change on biodiversity. So um, I should be honest that the lens I look through all of this, I, I, I look at all of this through is mammal paleobiology. My expertise is in the evolution of ecology in fossil mammals. Um, I work mostly in the North American record, but a little bit in Asia and occasionally in other places. And so several of the examples I'm going to show you, in fact, I think almost all of them um, are going to deal with the mammal record primarily. But you should keep in mind that one can do this with a variety of other fossil taxa. It just tends to be that paleontologists specialize because learning the morphological details is a little bit taxon specific, right? So I'll be talking about examples that have an impact on mammals, but all of these problems are ones that you can study with a variety of other data sets. Okay, so um, with that in mind, I'm going to offer you a couple of case studies in ways that we can ask questions about how ecosystem change affects the evolution of biodiversity. And the first one, and the most obvious one to deal with is uh, climate change, right? So we're all probably pretty familiar with this graph. This is the Wikipedia version of it, but it's out there in many forms. This is the ever popular hockey stick of climate, right? So the um, graph of climate over the last uh, temperature over the last um, you know thousand years or so, and you can see that for a while there it was pretty stable or or maybe cooling just a bit, and then there's this moment I don't know somewhere around the middle of the 1800s when all of a sudden the pattern changes and climate begins to warm. And one of the important things to think about when you look at anything like this is importance of scale and perspective. Okay, so we look at this curve here and there's clearly something really dramatically different going on. And there's there's been a big change in the system and this is a big climate change. That is certainly true. Furthermore, if you um, do some work to model where we're going, this isn't all of the story, right? So you've probably seen this, this is a graph from um, the 2014 IPCC report. And uh, this is an estimate of how much warming we will see relative to the last couple of decades um, if we 
you know, experience various different emission scenarios. And you can see that we're, we're you know, currently our te temperature anomaly is somewhere in the ballpark of half a degree of warming relative to the baseline, maybe, maybe a little more than half a degree relative to the baseline um, prior to the Industrial Revolution. But where we're headed, according to the IPCC, is probably, depending on the scenario, somewhere in the two to four degrees uh, Celsius global temperature increase um, over the past. And this is a moment where a little bit of Earth history perspective is useful because this is a lot. This is big relative to the amount of variation over the last thousand years or so. But here is global climate over the last 65 million years or so. Okay. And um, this is a pretty complex graph, so my apologies. Um, this is from a recent paper that tracked that um, change in temperature over the last 65 million years. And this top graph here is, is basically a proxy for temperature. You can see on the right side here, there's an axis that shows you the temperature difference relative to, um, to current times. Um, this lower part of it is, uh, is carbon isotopes, which gets at some of the causes for this change. Um, so based on the proxy that they've used here for temperature, you can see that today, we're in a period of relatively cool temperatures and that, you know, two to four degrees warming that the IPCC report is, is estimating there to maybe five, right? If you take the upper end of the uncertainty in their graph, um, that takes us up here, um, which is a place that we were um, somewhere around 17 or 18 million years ago. So this is a temperature regime that, at least from a paleontologist point of view, is not completely unprecedented. So on the one hand, the rate at which we're warming things is really rapid, um, and that's quite disturbing. This is a, a, a problem and a challenge. On the other hand, when we look back at Earth history, there's maybe something to, to compare this to in the way of climate change in that we have past environments that actually experience those temperatures. Um, and we can get an idea of how ecosystem structures were different then. And you could say, yeah, Sam, but like it's, it took it 17 million years to cool down to this point. Maybe some stuff has changed since then, which is totally fair. But I'll also point, to, point out to you, if you look at about the, the amplitude that gives you that four to eight degrees um, you know, temperature change, you can find events in the past of cooling that are of that magnitude. And in fact, there's this crazy spike here back at about uh, 56 million years ago or so that we call the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, um, which is a rapid warming event probably driven by greenhouse gas emissions at that time. And you can see that depending on exactly where you put yourself on the error bars, it may have actually been a much bigger warming event than we think we're driving. Um, and it was geologically almost instantaneous. Okay, so there are some, there's some precedents in Earth's history for the kind of climate change we're driving. And that's, I don't want that to be comforting or comfortable, but I, I, I think it's maybe a good reason to look back in the fossil record and see what it says about the biotic effects of that kind of change, all right? So if we do that, what does it tell us about whether or not climate change affects biodiversity? And I'm just gonna show you a few examples of studies that have used fossil data to give us a sense of how climate change might affect biodiversity um, on this sort of scale. Um, so this is from a really nice paper that came out this year by uh, Wolfgang Kiesling and his uh, colleagues um, really thinking about how we can use the paleontological record to, to inform our understanding of these conservation questions. And so what he's done here um, is picked out six past events that might be relevant to thinking about the magnitude of climate change that we are in the middle of driving ourselves um, right now. And he's looked at what the effects of that are on the fossil um, organisms existing at that time, right? So um, 
we have a series of events. There's that PETM or Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, that's something like five degrees Celsius warming, right? Um, and then you can see a, a series of others here. These first two, uh, the end Permian and the end Triassic are actually periods of mass extinction. So in the fossil record, they are um, times when uh, we saw those big extinction peaks. So that that will tell you one thing, right? Which is that, um, you know, sometimes a climate change of this magnitude does drive big extinction effects, right? Um, the other thing that you can see here is that many of these events, but not all of them, drove uh, range shifts that is moved species around. Okay, so you could affect that. You could expect that that might be an important effect of um, climate changes like this. You can see that some, but not all, of those events drove changes in the vegetation. Right, major structural changes in the way that plants looked on the um, on the Earth's surface. Um, and then a number of these events, in fact, most but not quite all of them, uh, drove reef crises like we're currently experiencing, right? The mass die off of um, coral organisms, right? Corals have been with us for, you know, close to half a billion years. And um, every time that, that temperatures go wacky, corals kind of take it in the shorts. It's not really good for them. Um, and this is one of the cases, one of the, the arguments for this that you can see that the, um, many of these climate change events, even the ones that aren't associated with the mass extinction otherwise, do seem to create reef crises. Okay, so there's one way in which we can look at these um, paleontological data and get a sense of the complexity of the way that ecosystems respond to climate change, okay? Um, and you can see that, that none of these events is exactly the same, even though the magnitude of warming is at least, you know, order of magnitude similar here, um, which gives you an idea that some other factors might be really important to the effects of a climate change like this on ecosystems. Okay, so that's one way that you can use um, paleontological evidence. You can look at these past events of, of climate change um, and get a sense of what's happened in the past and, and whether it might, um, be similar to what's going on today. Um, you can also dig in and try and really get at some of the structural rules. And I apologize for the slightly cryptic graph. This is what comes when you snitch your graphs from other people's papers, um, which were serving a different purpose in the paper than what I'm applying here. Um, so this is a study of um, essentially the relationship between climate and biodiversity in mammals. So this graph on the right side here with the label C shows the relationship today between the number of species on the y-axis here and latitude or um, in you know, today's world that provides a pretty good proxy for temperature because as you go up in latitude, it generally gets colder, all things equal, right? Um, and so there's this lovely relationship today between species richness and um, latitude. As you go to higher latitude, species richness drops off. And this relationship has been used at times in the past to infer that temperature or sort of like, you know, ambient kinetic energy, so to speak, um, is a driver of biodiversity. Um, that is, the more, the warmer it is, the more species you'll get. And that's reasonable to infer on the basis of of what we see today. The tropics have much higher biodiversity than we see at the poles, right? Um, so that's one of the you know, bases that people have used for arguing that um, you know, changes in temperature might change biodiversity. Although if you think about it, that would suggest that a warming event would drive an increase in biodiversity, which um, does not seem to be what we're seeing today, complexities to what's going on. Um, but the other two graphs here show the importance of looking at Earth's history before we infer process based on existing patterns. So this is what that latitudinal gradient in biodiversity looks like in the past. So if you go back about, I don't know, 50 million years or so, um, and you build the same um, curve based on fossil assemblages, um, 
you get, as you see, a completely different relationship. And that nice, neat, linear um, negative correlation between uh, the number of species and latitude goes away. And part of the reason for this, if you think back to that climate curve where it was warmer farther back in the last 50 million years or so, um, these curves, the A and B curves here, are constructed for a time when it was a whole lot warmer. And when the Earth's average temperature is warmer, that doesn't mean that everything gets hotter, tropics and poles. What it means is you get a lot more warming at the poles than you do uh, at tropical latitudes. And so you basically collapse that latitudinal gradient um, in a way that suggests that you'd get some funky nonlinear and geographically specific effects if you warm Earth's climate, okay? So does climate change affect biodiversity? Yeah, and in some not simple linear ways, right? We can't just use what we see today in terms of the relationship between temperature and species richness and say, ah, oh, well, if it warms up, we'll have more species, it'll be great, right? Um, <laughs> instead, you can say, if it warms up, some complex things are gonna happen. Um, and it might be that you'll see increases in diversity at the poles, or it might see, be that you'll see decreases in diversity in the tropics, right? Um, we expect that gradient may not hold up as you warm climates. Um, but, you know, you couldn't know this um, without looking at the fossil record, okay? Um, here's just sort of another way of thinking about the same kind of problem. Um, if you look at past paleontological studies of um, the relationship between climate change and diversity, um, in short, the geographic scale, which is your, your x-axis for all of these, um, graphs and the time scale over which that change happens makes for um, different effects. Okay, so this is a whole this is a meta analysis, and each one of these little points is um, is a study. Um, and it turns out that um, the the published studies find different effects at different geographic and temporal scales. Okay, so the rate of change really matters. And um, the geographic scale at which you look at it really matters, okay? So um, this is basically an argument that um, scale matters and the kind of change you expect to see is gonna be different depending on um, the scale at which things go on, okay? So that makes it a little more complicated also. And then I'm gonna show you just sort of like a, one more little line of evidence here, which is um, what does rapid climate change in particular do to diversity? Um, and this changes the conversation in yet a different way. And I apologize, yet again, complex graph intended for different purposes, but with that caveat, um, the middle of this here is mean annual temperature through time. And this is um, during that, um, that warming about 55 million years ago or so, 56 million years ago, um, at the beginning of what we call the Eocene epoch, right? Um, so this is, um, a period of really rapid warming um, right here at the, the PETM, the pa Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. And then there's this slower warming um, in the um, early Eocene Climatic Optimum or the EECO. Sorry for all the acronyms. Um, so you can look at rapid warming versus slightly slower warming separately. And if you look at the species, or actually in this case, the genera, the you know, groups of different kinds of mammals, um, they change in some interesting different ways. Number one, that rapid warming, in this case, seems to have dri driven a rapid increase in the number of different kinds of mammals um, in the area that they studied. This is a, in a site in Wyoming. Um, but the other thing I want you to notice is these little numbers here are the number of immigrant taxa. What it was driving was not a rapid evolutionary change. This is probably too rapid for evolutionary responses, but rather, a rapid ecological change um, that allowed immigration to bring in new species. And so species movement is a big part of the response of, um, of uh, taxa to 
um, ecological change to, to these uh, rapid climatic warming events. Okay, and if you look at the warming event later on, it's slower, seems to have a smaller effect, and a lot less of it is a result of immigration. Okay, so um, that's interesting. You can get in situ evolution if it's slow enough, and maybe not so much if it's not, right? Okay, so just to sum up that little case study, um, if we look at how climate change affects biodiversity, number one, it's complicated, right? So um, the interaction among different confounding factors is really important to the outcome of how climate change affects biodiversity. The patterns we observe today are not always adequate to explain what will happen at other times, which means we really need to look at some of the fossil record um, case studies in order to understand what we might expect as we go forward, right? The patterns that we're using today, we can't necessarily use to infer process all by themselves. Um, scale matters. So the time and the spatial scale over which things happen um, is pretty important to um, what we can understand about what's going on. Um, and as I said, the fossil record can offer us some important insights. So let's talk about one more of these. Um, and one more example, one more part of uh, the process. And we'll see if I can convince you that the, the fossil record offers us a, another way of looking at these things. Um, so the second bit I'm gonna talk about is habitat alteration, right? This is something that as humans, we do pretty extensively. Um, you've all probably heard about the effects of uh, people's water use on aridification of native ecosystems, right? So, you know, the Colorado River no longer makes it to the Gulf of California, right? Um, in part because we're pulling the water out upstream. And so that aridifies the areas downstream, right? What does that do? Hmm, interesting question. Deforestation, also a thing, although maybe more of a concern um, in the time I was growing up than it is, it's not quite so much in the media today. Um, still an ongoing part of what people do, right? We cut down trees both to make space for growing crops and also for using the, the wood as a natural resource. Um, habitat fragmentation, you know, as construction and agriculture um, break up habitats into little pieces. Um, all of these are things that are going to affect um, habitats for um, native species, for, for wild species. Um, and remember, as I showed you before, scale matters and the present is not always the key to the past. So, so let's think about um, what we can learn from the fossil record. Conveniently, we have a, a great case study in the alteration of habitats in the fossil record in the rise of open habitats. So this is a thing that those of us working on mammals in the last 65 million years get really excited about. Um, one of the big stories is as you cool climate from you know that time 50 something million years ago to today, um, you see changes in the structure of habitats across much of the globe. So in the time of those Eocene habitats that I was just talking about, the 55, 56 million year old um, ecosystems that the studies were done in, most of uh, most of the habitats that you would see would have been relatively forested, okay, um, based on the floral record, um, based on the chemistry of the soil, based on the sediments that we see. Um, almost all of the ecosystems that we have records of um, are relatively forested, okay. They're closed, what we call closed habitats, right. They're, you know, all covered in trees for the most part, okay. Not universal, but most places. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that I don't have time to go into, but that was the case for a long time. Um, but by the time you get to about 10 million years ago, a lot of the Earth's surface is more open habitats, grasslands, deserts, um, you know, open woodlands and, and things like that. Not all of it, obviously, you know, get to today, there's still plenty of grasslands and deserts, but there's also a lot of closed ecosystems as well. Um, so the rise of these open habitats and the spread of open habitats offers us a great study in habitat alteration. Okay, we can see structural change, we can see, um, you know, uh, habitat fragmentation as those forests break up um, and as deforestation happened um, through natural processes, 
um, you actually got habitat fragmentation of the forested habitats. Um, and we can look at how animals respond to those uh, habitat changes and get a sense of what this looks like um, in terms of um, evolutionary and ecological changes in, uh, in the fauna. So um, one of the classic study systems for this is one that many of you probably have encountered at some point in the past, the evolution of horses, right? This is a classic paleontological and evolutionary study, right? That if you look at horses 55 million years ago, they're small, about the size of a collie, right? So a mid-sized dog. Um, they had uh, four-toed feet, so little, you know, splayed um, feet. And um, they also had uh, teeth that indicate um, what we call a browsing diet, which means eating fruits and leaves and a variety of, of sorts of plant materials. Um, and that, of course, is in contrast with modern horses, right? So this is uh, Shizwalski's horse, or you know, here's a modern thoroughbred in shadow behind it here, um, which are pretty profoundly different. They're immense, or, you know, an order of magnitude larger, or, or in some cases, a couple order of magnitude, orders of magnitude larger in size. Um, they have this really simplified foot structure that reflects a change in locomotor habit, right? They're they're running. They're what we call cursorial animals. Um, so they, they get around uh, a lot faster and more efficiently. Um, and if you have looked inside the mouth of a horse, you know that their teeth are also profoundly different, reflecting their grazing diet, right? Horses mostly eat grass, which is a really abrasive food. And um, you see it in their, their teeth and, and other aspects of their ecology. So it turns out this change that we see in horses, in this classic evolutionary study, is true of many of the other large mammals out there. So here's the same thing in elephant relatives, right? And our modern uh, elephant has seen the same change in the teeth, right? Towards um, greater uh, abrasion resistance and more grazing. Um, you can see they go from this little guy, Moratherium here to, um, they go quite rapidly to much larger forms, but you generally see sort of an increase uh, in size over time. And also a more, what we would call um, sort of somewhat cursorial, that is a more efficient um, movement habit. They're not runners. Um, elephants don't run, that's a bad idea, but um, they're certainly more efficient at moving over large open ecosystems, okay? So, so that's what the herbivores do. Um, and this is something that you see across all the, the large herbivore groups. Um, carnivores respond to it too. These are fossil dogs. And if you look at fossil dogs from even as recently as like 35 million years ago, they look like this little Hesperus ion here. They're kind of small and um, kind of, you know, raccoon-y in their, their form. They're omnivorous or, or hypo-carnivorous as we call it. So not very carnivorous. Um, and by the time you get to 10 million years ago, you get things like this bone crushing dog that's very hyena-like in its form, right? So they're chasing these much bigger herbivores around. Um, and specializing in the kind of pursuit that you can do in an open habitat, okay? Um, I actually don't work so much on large mammals, although I've had students who have, um, but um, there are some, some things that we understand from looking at this that are kind of relevant and interesting to, to thinking about how habitat alteration affects faunas. Um, one of them is uh, if you look at um, the way that those habitats change, um, and you look back at about, it looks like 27 million years ago, you start to see these grass dominated open habitats. Okay, so this is just a, a proxy, this middle column here, B is a proxy for um, the dominance of grass, the proportion of grass in ecosystems. And um, you can see it's sort of a point where we start to see grass dominated ecosystems appear. And you can see a bit of that habitat fragmentation um, effect that I talked about, right? So there's some of these individual sites where it's mostly grass. And then there are still a number of sites early on that are still mostly not grass, right? These, these sort of orange points here are, um, are not grassy. So you can see a bunch of them. You could kind of, depending on where you go, maybe you could find a place with a lot of grass and you could find a place with not a lot of grass. Um, and then as you go later in time, you get 
sort of more and more of it dominated by just grassy ecosystems. So you lose those, the previous habitats, okay? As you do that, you see some interesting responses from the, the animals. This is a graph just of the shape of the teeth, of high, how high crowned they are, which tells you something about how much, um, much grass they're eating. And the B here are the ones with the kind of omnivorous or, or you know, less grazing teeth. Um, M are what we call mesodont or sort of starting to change their diet towards um, being able to eat graze. Um, and then H are the hypsodont things. They're the ones with um, really high crown teeth to deal with the abrasion that comes from eating grass. And what I want you to think about for the pattern here is first that the change in the teeth in these large herbivores happens early on, or sorry, not early on, it happens later than the change in the grass, right? So the change in the habitats happens at around 27 million years, something like that. It doesn't change in the teeth until uh, after 20 million years ago. And the other thing to notice is that it happens first by adding the things that can eat grass, and then by losing the things that can't. So you actually see an increase in diversity at the moment when this habitat's fragment, because you have specialists in both kinds of habitats um, appear in the record. So that's kind of interesting um, that large mammals do this. So if we just looked at the big mammals, which is what we did for a long time, um, you would see a lag in the response of animals to habitat change. And you would see diversification followed by diversity loss as the habitat fragmentation happens. So that's, that's interesting. Um, I got really interested in what goes on in small mammals. Um, so small mammals have some similar things going on in their teeth. So here's some examples. Here's one of those low crown teeth for something that eats not grass. Um, and then here are the various stages along the way of higher and higher tooth crowns to deal with the abrasion of, um, of eating a grassier diet. So this is a vole, it does that, it eats grass, right? Um, the other thing that we see in small mammals, kind of equivalent to what you do in the large mammals, right? They, they don't just change their diets, they also change the way they get around. So just like the horses get sort of taller and um, better at running, small mammals have some different ways of dealing with this. Um, one of them is their equivalent of running, so hopping and, um, and that kind of thing that let them cover cover ground like this little jerboa. You also see burrowing appear um, in a lot of uh, small mammal lineages um, in order to you know, dig a hole under the ground to hide from predators in those more, more open environments where there's less cover. Um, and I gotta go a little quick because I'm, I'm, I didn't go as fast early on as I, as I was before. But one of the things I want you to see, this is equivalent to that graph that I showed you for large mammals. So on the left-hand side here is the frequency of different um, tooth types. Um, and what I want you to notice is that the change in small mammals towards these um, more, you know, abrasive diets seems to happen earlier, right around dead on the time that you see the increase in grassy habitats, right? So small mammals seem to respond earlier. And if you look at burrowing and jumping and running here, um, those also seem to really take off in the... Um, ecotypes you see in uh, ecosystems around the time that grassy habitats appear. So it seems like the small mammals are taking advantage of these new habitats sooner than their large counterparts. Okay, so in summary, just to give you a sense of what this habitat alteration stuff shows us, um, in mammals, diet and locomotion uh, seem to change in response to habitat change both in large mammals and small ones. Um, those changes just as for um, the biodiversity response to rapid climate change may be a result of immigration in some cases or in situ evolution, right? That's something we're, we're still working on. But the small mammals actually may offer you a more sensitive or an earlier response to habitat change, um, which is worth keeping in mind, right? This may be the, the thing we wanna look at if we're looking for responses to habitat fragmentation and deforestation and that kind of thing. Um, and this is some work we have in progress. So we're working in this, this um, embarrassingly beautiful part of, uh, of Western North America. This is a Waihee Gorge in uh, Eastern Oregon. 
looking at how small mammals track habitats in the fossil record. So this is a, a stay tuned um, kind of notice. So, um, so where are we? You know, I've just talked to you a little bit about a couple of case studies in, uh, in conservation paleobiology and using the fossil record to understand conservation questions. Um, I argue that fossil data provide really the only way of knowing how, what we're doing in, in some of this uncharted territory. We can look back in the fossil record and at least see some of what it looked like in the past. That doesn't mean that it always predicts how it will happen in the future, but it can give us a set of constraints around what we can reasonably expect. Um, there is some precedent for the kinds of changes humans are making to ecosystems, although what we're doing now is different from past changes in some ways. All those past changes are different from one another. It's a worthwhile system to look at. Um, and just sort of, you know, a plug for, for what we're doing, knowing the history of systems like these may help us guess what's coming and possibly mitigate some of the effects on biodiversity. So um, thanks for your attention and thanks to um, all the people who've um, contributed to this work. And I'd just like to say also, um, thanks to the National Youth Science Camp for many years ago, um, putting me on a track that somehow put me in the middle of this, right? The, my, my job is doing science in the outdoors. And um, it's one of those things that I experienced at science camp and um, I continue to experience on an annual basis um, since then. So, um, so thanks to all of you and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Sam. It looks like there are two questions. Uh, so we will ask them and see, uh, see, what, your, uh, see what your opinion is. Um, so first question is, do you think the geological records that humans will leave behind will be vastly different from other rapid warming events in the past? That's a, um, that's a question a lot of people want to know the answer to. Um, there's not a, a super easy way um, to um, get at that um, other than to look at, you know, sort of records of human trash. Um, you know, conveniently, this is a conversation that we've had with archeologists to some degree. You know, I think humans are leaving behind the things that we make in a way that past, um, past changes really haven't, right? Um, we really mess with, the soil and the earth structure in some pretty profound ways. And that leads to some of the depth of habitat alteration that we engage in. Um, that said, the scale of habitat alteration of you know, what humans are doing, at least locally, is not always all that much bigger than some of the, the crazy catastrophic events in Earth's past, right? I mean, the the end Permian extinction 240 million years ago was precipitated by um, a massive flood basalt eruption in Siberia. And we're talking like, you know, hundreds, uh, actually, if I remember correctly, I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Um, thousands of cubic kilometers of, of lava erupting over Siberia and erupting through coal and hence basically burning fossil fuels, right? Created a you know 10 degrees C warming event and drove the biggest extinction in the history of life on earth. So maybe you know good object lesson in what we could potentially do, but leaves a heck of a record. You know, here we are, you know, a quarter of a billion years later, and boy can we see it, right? <laughs> like it's there. Um, but that said, I think the scope of our impact, the geographic area over which we impact the the planet um, is probably bigger than many of these events in the past. It'll be, it's interesting to think about, I mean, horrible things that scientists say, right? But it's interesting to think about um, how broadly humans have whacked with the record that will be left behind after we go. Awesome. Uh, next up is, does the flashiness of the KPG impact uh, driven extinction make it tougher for the public to understand the, the role of CO2 in other mass extinction events? 
I think so. I mean, I think, you know, dinosaurs here, I sit with a bunch of, you know, Lego dinosaurs on the, on the shelf next to me, right? Um, I think dinosaurs are kind of dangerous that way, right? Um, you know, they're really appealing. Um, and as a consequence, the moment when non-avian dinosaurs go extinct, everybody's like, oh man, that's a really big important one. It turns out that's one of the smallest of the big five mass extinctions in the history of life on earth. It's a big mass extinction and, and OMG, no more T-Rex, right? But at the same time, um, it's not the biggest one, right? So as I just mentioned, the biggest extinction in the history of life on earth did not drive dinosaurs extinct. Um, it actually, if you ever had that little tube of plastic dinosaurs, you know, there's the one with the little sail on its back, Dinetrodon, right? Um, every paleontologist gets their knickers in a twist over that one because it's not a dinosaur. It's actually on the, the line leading to mammals rather than on the line leading to reptiles and birds. Um, that was one of the, the casualties of that end Permian mass extinction 240 million years ago. That was the big guy. And that one seems to have been driven by climate change, essentially, right? By massive climate change. And, and as I said, not entirely non-analogous to what we've got going on now. Now, you know, full disclosure, I work on much shallower time than that. And so I'm reading the literature. I don't actually work on the, the extinction in question. And probably there's some paleontologist out there who's like, no, Hopkins, you've got it wrong. That's not about that, right? But, um, but I, I do think that, um, that there are these things in the fossil record that really capture the public imagination, right? The, the ridiculousness of dinosaurs, right? Like, you know, sauropod dinosaurs are like the biggest thing ever to live on land and they're just crazy large and you can't not go, whoa, right? Like there is an animal bigger than six school buses right? Like, whoa. And so you get really wedded to these things, but those big events can really um, kind of have a disproportionate impact on how we think the world works. Um, and the fact is that it's, it's not only things like the Permo-Triassic extinction 240 million years ago, but, but like all the little stuff that happens in between um, that tells us more maybe about what's going on, right? Right now, we have not driven anything even all that close to a mass extinction yet. Now we can, you know, stick with it, guys. Commit, right? Um, and and we probably could, but um, it's it's more useful for us right now to look at some of the things that weren't mass extinctions, in part because we might want to know what it looks like when climate really changes and you don't make everything go extinct, right? That's that's maybe aspirational that we might be able to think about um, a way that all this kind of climate change could happen um, and stuff could could not go extinct, right? And many times it doesn't, um, but that doesn't mean it isn't serious because even when you don't have a mass extinction, maybe things you really care about do, right? It doesn't necessarily, we don't have to drive, you know, 60% of life on earth extinct to make our lives really bad, right? It turns out if you if you took a handful of species out of Earth's ecosystems, we would we would be up a creek, right? Um, there are a lot of species, or not a lot, there are a small number of species that we're really heavily dependent on. And of course, there's one species we really don't want to drive extinct, right? Selfishly, we're humans, and we are not the least sensitive species on the planet, right? And so it's important to look not just at like OMG extinction of the dinosaurs, but also at like what happens day to day and what drives particular kinds of species extinct because those subtleties are going to really matter to us if we're talking about the extinction of i don't know corn or rice or cows or chickens right <laughs> like things that are really essential to um, a lot of the way that we you know work and live as human beings a really solid answer you know i'd like to keep as many things around as i can so uh <laughs> And then it uh, looks like one last question is um, a bit of a fun one. Uh, do you think that far future paleontologists will be able to differ differentiate our human driven changes uh, versus a, nor uh, a natural phenomenon like an asteroid impact or geological shift? Probably, um, <laughs> just because, uh, you know, sort of fall back on my answer to the first question, right? We are doing a lot of things that tend to, to preserve pretty well in, uh, the geologic record, right? The key is that the geologic record preserves anything that doesn't get eroded away. 
And a lot of what we're doing is building on floodplains and stuff like that. And that that will be gone, you know, a few million years from now. Um, but, you know, anywhere where sediment is accumulating and burying things um, will leave a record behind. And man, there are people in those places too, right? And so I think there will be, you know, the ability to see the kind of alterations we make, um, especially because there have been species in the past that have left, you know, things they built in the fossil record, right? Um, my personal favorite as somebody who works on small mammals primarily is um, this thing called paleocaster. Um, and any of you who have been through Nebraska are familiar with um, agate fossil beds where we have burrows of paleocaster in the fossil record. There's a great one encased in glass outdoors in the exhibits there. So you can see this beautiful spiral burrow that's like eight feet tall um, that these things built, right? We're leaving our equivalent of paleocaster burrows all over the place, right? Um, and anywhere that stays buried, um, you know, people have the potential, or not people, you know, like the the cockroach sciences, scientists of you know several million years from now have the potential to uncover evidence that that we did it, um, and that we were responsible for some of these changes and not just some sort of natural phenomenon. We have another question: uh, What gives you hope that humans can change their behavior and avoid a mass extinction event caused by humans? Or should a 57 year old just give up hope and uh, <laughs> just give up and hope we make it another 40 years? You know, the, the thing that gives me hope actually is um, the resilience of life in the past, right? As a paleontologist, this is the most hopeful part of it. Um, you know, we hear about the asteroid impact that drove the extinction of the dinosaurs, and we're like, oh man, asteroid impacts, bad news bears, right? You know, turns out there are asteroid impacts all through the fossil record. And they don't even make a hiccup in the biodiversity record most of the time. That asteroid impact was not in and of itself enough to drive a mass extinction. It hit a whole bunch of other coincidences. And that's that's another lecture entirely. And honestly, there's someone else who should give it, not me. But um, you know, that event um, didn't, um, it, it often, that kind of event doesn't drive a mass extinction. Um, and there have been climate change events of the magnitude of the one that we're having that haven't actually driven even a significant change in extinction rates in the past. The fact that that Permo-Triassic extinction 240 million years ago with, with you know, 10 degrees of warming, yeah, it drove a mass extinction event, but life made it through and diversified on the far side of it, right? So um, I had a professor in graduate school who um, was an ecologist, modern ecologist working on modern ecosystems, and she, um, told me that she thought we were going to drive all life on Earth extinct. And I said, oh, not a chance, right? Like not even close, right? We will be not the last species to go extinct. And, and once we're gone, you know, other stuff will figure out a way to make this work, right? So, um, I mean, that's that's a that one's a slightly more bitter way of looking at the world um, than some and might not give the 57-year-old a massive amount of hope. But I think the resilience of life um, is something that gives you hope. And as, as the changes that we make have a bigger effect on us, I think people will get more and more urgent about this. For me as a 45 year old, one of the things that gives me hope is how different the rhetoric is now relative to what it was when I was a 20 year old, right? How different the way people talk, how many people are more comfortable with saying climate is changing full stop, right? And we knew this in 1994 when I went to science camp, like we knew that climate change was happening. Right. And the fact that, you know, those of us at science camp knew it um, didn't mean that the general public really, like, really got it. Right. And I think at this level, and, you know, if you look at the numbers, people actually get it more because it's a little more obvious. Right. The things that are going on. So I think there's hope in that also. Right. I think there is hope that people are are figuring it out. Um, and and as I say, I think that ecosystems can rebound from a lot in the the structures in the, the Earth's, um, the complexity of the interaction between the physical and the biotic environment is such that um, I think if we can get our heads straight, um, it can probably recover in such a way that we can keep doing something like, you know, your human experience, um, even if we do take a while to get the message that we've got to change. Throwing in a little bit of hope at the air at the end there. Um, well, Sam, thank you very much. I don't see any further questions popping up in the chat. 
um, but we had over 100 different people join us for this lecture. So um, from me and everybody else, thank you very much. And uh, with that, we will wrap up the, uh, the, this version of the alumni lecture series. Um, Sam, is there any way that you would like people to either reach out to you, either on LinkedIn or anything? Um, I'm happy to have um, emails from any folks who want to talk about this stuff further. Um, it's, I'm, I'm happy to chat. You can find me quite easily. I'm in the University of Oregon and all over the webpage. So um, yeah, I'd love to talk to people more. Well, perfect. Well, thank you very much. And with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.